Wow. Electricity really is quite good. I wonder what Pex will be like in the future. If only there was a way of finding out. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Heavy Repping. My name is John Tron Davidson, and I'm here once again in our super best, rather dark, very shaky test location in the southwest of England. So in the Plectroverse, we do tend to take things a little bit for granted in the sense that there is kind of an assumption with a lot of players I've spoken to that picks were always like this, uh, the Dunlop Yellow Giant. However, this was not always the case. So today I'm going to give you the most Cliff Notes version of the history of the Plectrum uh, in the fastest, most broad sense possible. Now before we begin, it is worth noting that uh, there is a book that's all about the history of celluloid called PIX! Exclamation mark, which was written by a gentleman called Will Hoover and it is essential reading if you're, even if you're only interested in the guitar and never mind PIX to find out where a lot of this stuff came from. That is the most, the most in-depth uh, assessment of this sort of stuff that I've read and certainly I would very, very strongly encourage you to go and get a copy of that for the full Lambuna. Today what I'm going to do is offer you my brief synopsis on the history of this fantastic item that powers so much of the music around the world. So, without further ado, let's go. In order to understand the history of the pick, what we've got to do is go back a long, long time. And when I say a long time, I mean going back to hundreds of years BC. The reason for that is because plectrums weren't always just used for guitar, and indeed, they weren't always just used for mandolin and dulcimer and all that sort of thing. So imagine you are back in ancient Japan and you're going to play your shamisen uh, or your biwa. You would be using a pick known as a bachi, and the bachi was shaped kind of like a like a scraper for your windscreen, and it was held like this with that long edge down here and the prong coming up here and you play it like that. Uh, you also had players in Saudi Arabia playing the oud with a pick known as a risha, which was actually a long thin one. That, now these are still being made because there's still people playing the oud and so on, uh, but traditionally they were made from eagle feather and the sarod, which is another Far Eastern instrument, is made from, uh, uses a pick made from coconut shell. However, the term to describe all these things, this catch-all term, came from ancient Greek and was then morphed into Latin and then from Latin into English. And the word is plectron, uh, which in Greek means uh, to strike with or anything to strike with, like the head of a spear. That then made its way into Latin and became plectrum, which then we took on in the West as plectrum. With all that being said, the real modern history of the plectrum kind of starts in the early 1900s. So in 1922, Mr. Dandrea of the Dandrea family uh, met a gentleman who was selling celluloid offcuts and he made these little heart shapes out of them and his son said that these looked kind of like uh, the shapes that he'd been using to play the mandolin with and his dad went oh really so he decided that he would take a few of these and get hammer dies and he would hammer the celluloid out and that would then become these different shapes now as it happens i'm lucky enough to have a few bits and pieces from the earlier days or at least the shapes thereof so this is a proplex, this is a, a relatively modern one, but if we go all the way back to the 1950s, this is an original celluloid one. Uh, these came from Joe Macy, uh, the great collector. And these are done in what's known as the badge style. So the reason why picks became made so ubiquitously of celluloid is because in the early days, 18, 1800s into the 1900s, uh, Picks that were used for things like the Greek lyre were made from materials like uh, hawkbill turtle shell, which then got put on the endangered species list, thanks guitarists. And uh, 
that ended up becoming outlawed. And so everyone was looking around for an alternative because a great, you get a great tone off of that. I do know a couple of people uh, who have original turtle shell picks that they bought in the 1950s and 60s. And they say the sound is very, very good, but obviously it's not especially um, robust in the long run. Uh, if, especially if you were going to play modern styles that you wouldn't go and play grindcore with a <laughs> with a turtle shell pick. It's, it just they're not designed for that. Anyway, technically, they're not designed for anything. It's a piece of a turtle. But you know what I'm trying to say. In that earlier part of the of the 1900s, um, when celluloid became a thing, people were saying celluloid. This is this is incredibly cheap plastic. We can use it for everything, and it got into everything. It was in pens, it was in Plectra, obviously, it was being used for um, Tupperware and storage and all sorts of stuff. And the beauty of it was, it was very, very easy to shape, it was very easy to change its consistency. You could colour it however you wanted uh, as time went on, and celluloid just became the standard. And it wasn't until a bit later on, um, 1981 was when Dunlop standardised the Tortex series, which is made from Delrin, which is a different material altogether. Now celluloid does have its appeal, for sure. There's still a lot of companies making picks from celluloid, but the big problem with it is it's actually a bit dangerous. So celluloid in its natural state, um, when it's in pick form like this, as vintage collectors will tell you, is that it's very, keen on moisture. So what it would do would be, if you left it in, a lot of guys used to put them in those sort of folders for collecting coins, but the problem is if there's no through breeze, if there's no air circulating around them, the material is constantly seeking moisture. And essentially what it would do is it would sort of steam itself inside the plastic and it would rot. And also it was incredibly combustible because this is the same celluloid. When people say stuff's been filmed on celluloid, the universal symbol for filming. This is what they're talking about. It was a, a celluloid film. It was very, very combustible. It was very prone to catching fire. That became, it became impractical in the long run. Everybody was looking around for alternatives. Now, a lot of companies started making things out of nylon when nylon became more ubiquitous. I'm very, very lucky to have this. Uh, this is a Moshe. Uh, it's one of the earlier nylon picks. It is a beautiful, beautiful thing. Uh, there's no beveling to this whatsoever. It is a completely right angled edge and the hole is actually a little rough in the middle, but this is an, an incredible piece of pick history. I'm very, very thankful for this. Big shout out to Eric Lawyer for, um, for sorting me out with it. If you go back to some of the earlier shapes, there are things like these. These are uh, a couple of old Fender ones, extra heavies. And um, this again was, this again is a really interesting thing because all the shapes back then were completely different. You got much, much longer, thinner ones for mandolin, uh, and you got more blunt ones for acoustic guitar and so on. Uh, but as time progressed and we moved on into the into the 70s and then into the 80s, this became the norm. So these are Dunlop ones. This is a modern Dunlop 73, but this made from Delrin. This is a 351 shape, which was standardised by D'Andrea back in the 1920s. It was 1922, I think, when Sam D'Andrea decided to standardise all the shapes. And they're all named after the hammer dies that were used to cut them. So the 351 shape, which is this, was it was die stamp 351. Uh, then you have the triangular shape, uh, the 346, and so on and so forth. I'll see if I can put a picture up here of some of the other shapes which you don't really see a lot in the modern day because they were designed at a time when much like the much like the way the guitar progressed uh, the guitar wasn't always six strings and everything else if you look into hold on a minute, this wonderful book here the illustrated directory of guitars goes all the way back to from this is from the modern stuff like Klein's uh, all the way back to the earliest uh, earliest instruments. And the thing that's really interesting about this is that although the guitar really hasn't been around for a long time in the grand scheme of things, it's still been about for a few hundred years. And these are some of the earliest 
models from the 1500s. So you can see the guitar was a very different thing back then. We can see things like uh, it's got multiple strings and courses and a sound hole and everything, but the sound hole wasn't even ubiquitous. So it used to be, back in the day, that your, your sound hole was just another place to have uh, sort of ornate and lavish extras. And the guitar originally only had five courses, like five strings, and then that became six and some of them were doubled up and everything. So that, much like that's evolved from the 1500s, picks have also evolved with time because we don't need the same thing from them and we've understood ergonomics a lot better. So for example, it sort of makes me very confused to think that um, if we look at, I've just got some, I've got some very modern examples here, but uh, if we think about what Jim Dunlop back in 19, 1981 might have thought of something like this. This is a Howling Monkey Antonius. Uh, it's made from vegetable ivory and it's cut in this Indiana Jones key sort of formation. Uh, this is still technically the shape of a 351. If we look at them on an overlay, it's just got a few bits missing and it's made from a different material, but back then that just wasn't a thing. What was a thing though is that, thanks to Music Road for sending these by the way, back when a lot of companies used to use different things for sticking to the plectrums to improve grip. I'm going to do a separate video about this so don't worry about that. But one of the things they used to do was use little rings of cork and it was very very common to see uh, plectrums of this nature with little cork rings on the front in order to give you a bit more grip. That has persisted into the present day. These are modern cork rings. Uh, there are also lots of other options like monster grips and, and all that sort of stuff which are made from silicon. If we think about how far it's come from things like this badge, which is not especially fun to play with, and in all honesty I bought this to see what pick construction was like back then. It's very, very rounded. It feels very um, sort of, this is what we're doing today, boys. I always loved the idea of people like, and Jim Dunlop obviously very sadly passed away relatively recently, but I always wonder what he thought of stuff like this. This is the Raptor. Uh, it's made from uh, three mil acrylic. Very, very strange shape. It's definitely, it's, it's just got its own thing going on completely. And even though there were some pretty wild plectrums back in the day, uh, the idea of all this sort of stuff would just be like way, way out here. If you think about what the guitar was like, what the electric guitar was like back in its infancy, uh, and we're talking, if we accept the whole Rickenbacker uh, flying plan period uh, in the 1930s and go into like the 40s with your uh, 49 when the telly came out, when the, the original uh, snakehead telly came out and then when the Strat came out, it, the Strat back then, we take it completely for granted now, but the Strat was blowing people's minds back then, this thing from the space age and it's got three pickups and it's got this recess in the back and these springs and we take that completely for granted. It's like a dad's guitar and everyone's into keezels and seven piece necks and like headless designs again and all that sort of thing. Um, but we've come really, really, we've come really, really far with it. It's a really, really exciting thing. Now the reason why I'm going into this is not just because it's interesting, because it is interesting, that's why you're on this channel. But what's really fascinating about it is that if the pick had come to this, and we'd said, okay, that's enough, we've done enough. We'd have just stayed there. But it never stopped changing. It never stopped evolving and becoming more than it was. It never stopped becoming something else. And the reason is, is because players are not the same. Somebody who plays a jazz three all the time will find playing like this, like holding a, you know, holding a notebook. And somebody who plays with this might find the jazz three just too small. Uh, I've spoken to hundreds of players over the years and although they don't have the same interest in picks as probably you or myself, they've still got in their head like, no, I have to use this, this is how I get my thing, 
you know, some guys that want to use nothing but fender thins, some people only use Jazz 3 maxi grips, some people that will only use uh, a coin or steel picks or, uh, you know, wood picks or anything like that. And it's not because, as is the way with all things, it's not because the other picks are wrong and it's not because there is a lack of um, cohesion in the industry. But what is, what is utterly, utterly fascinating is that in the modern day, with the time that we've actually spent developing the pick, we've really only scratched the surface of it. There are some people developing things uh, now. Uh, there's a gent in Argentina at Deki Picks who is making this incredible contraption that goes around your finger. It's called the Eye of Horus. It goes around your finger like that and it has all these component parts so the pick stays in the same place all the time. Um, but even though that's an invention from the last few months, there's previous versions of that, like the snake pick, which went around your finger, and you know, different types of thumb picks, the Fred Kelly bumblebee and all that sort of thing. Um, there's all these little avenues that the pick's gone down over the years that maybe they haven't come to fruition. Maybe it's been somebody's dream and there's like five guys worldwide who are absolutely devoted to this one kind of really weird pick. But isn't that incredibly exciting? Isn't that just as exciting as the pedal world? Where people are fighting over what different types of tube screamers are and what differences they make? Isn't it as exciting as somebody saying like, oh, this clone costs like you know, 1,500 quid, two grand, and everyone's trying to build up to that circuit but not getting near it, but that doesn't, it doesn't stop people from trying because we're always trying to squeeze that little bit extra out. It has to be a special thing. This is a special thing. It is how we interact with our instrument. It's incredibly important. So, I hope you've enjoyed this little, more of a rant than anything else, I guess, about the, uh, the most briefest of synopses regarding the uh, history of the Plectrum. I would encourage you to go and check out Mr. Will Hoover's book. It's out of print now, but you can find it all over the internet. It's a very, very good read. It's very, very informative and covers way more ground than I could possibly do in a video. You'll find out more than you could ever possibly have imagined about picks. And if there's an old pick that you want me to see if I can find, because I'm going to be doing a little bit more about vintage picks in the future, uh, if you can, f if there's anything that you want me to cover, please hit me up. Uh, it's heavyrepping at gmail.com, or go to Instagram uh, at heavyrepping. Give me a shout. Leave something in the comments, whatever you like. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe uh, to help Heavy Repping grow and become part of the Plectroverse. I will welcome you in with open arms, regardless of whatever you play. In the meantime, I will see you next week, Tuesday, 6:30 p.m. here on YouTube. My name is John Tron Davidson, this is Heavy Repping, and I'll see you soon. So just remember, if you're not sure what to do in life, rep hard, rep heavy.